right. Hopefully we're all uh, hydrated at least um, and prepared for uh, Gardner Campbell, who's going to bat clean up today. Um, lots of exciting baseball metaphors that I'll leave out from there. Um, as some of you may have heard, uh, John Udell had a, had a family emergency and couldn't be with us today. And we wish him and his family well, and we, we thank him for his support of, uh, of UMW's work over the last decade. So um, you should know that Gardner had uh, a whole 48 hours to prepare for this presentation. So it's going to be great. <laughs> uh, no, it's going to be terrific. Um, uh, so let me introduce Gardner Campbell more formally. Uh, Dr. W. Gardner Campbell. Uh, is Vice Provost for Learning Innovation and Student Success at Virginia Commonwealth University. Uh, before coming to VCU, Gardner held posts at Virginia Tech as Senior Director for Networked Innovation in the Division of Teaching Enhanced Learning and Online Strategies and Associate Professor of English. That is, how did you fit that all in one business card? Um, at Baylor, where he was Founding Director of the Academy for Teaching and Learning and Associate Professor of Literature, Media, and Learning. And of course, here at Mary Washington, where he was professor of English and assistant vice president for teaching and learning technologies during the founding days of that division now known as DTLT. All told, Dr. Campbell has worked at four Virginia institutions and went to graduate school at a fifth. So if anyone can comment on the state of Virginia higher education, it's Gardner. Uh, and today, he's going to talk about observable work in an age of disruption. Please welcome Gardner Campbell. Thank you, Jeff. Am, am I on the air? Are we good? Everything good? OK, good. Andy gives me thumbs up, so I figure we're in good shape. Um, so it's a great pleasure to be here. Luckily, I had nothing else to do in the last 48 hours. So I was able to devote a large amount of my copious leisure time to thinking through what I would share with you all today. Um, but uh, it is kind of a karmic debt. The last time I was this close uh, to John Udell on the program, I got out of a van I had driven like a bat out of Denver to Aspen, or actually it was Snowmass, where I succumbed immediately to food poisoning from the Denver airport and altitude sickness. It was a mess. John Udell was going to be talking about disruption with me. He proceeded, undisrupted, to go ahead and deliver his talk while I was up sipping Coke and eating crackers in my hotel room. So, it is a debt I'm happy to repay. Unfortunately, John cannot be with us today, but I will step in, only mildly disrupted, and try to share something with you uh, that will round out the afternoon, perhaps. Uh, remember, I am all that stands between you and the wine and the snacks, although may, some of you may have gotten into those already. That's fine. Uh, but the good news is I am all that stands between you and the reception, so that's great. Uh, I understand that my blog post, recent blog post on optimism came up earlier today. Uh, so let me hasten to add that I lately, in particular, have been blogging against whatever I'm feeling. So I wrote the blog post on optimism on a day when I was feeling very depressed. And that's a way of telling you that what I'm about to say here is also optimistic because of some real depression that I'm struggling with. But what I've tried to frame in terms of what I take to be some of John Udell's central concerns, and maybe something that we can uh, at least take away as a kind of one of those inspirational, motivational things that you know to distrust. So let's get started. So John Udell likes to talk about observable work. And this is from a blog post on a woodworker, Historic Homeworks. Well, I think John Leak, John, John Udell, celebrated in a blog post uh, back in 2009, I believe it was. This is a fellow who has all, all of the work he does narrated, explained, videoed, the whole thing up online. And it has, of course, increased his business because you can both learn from him and then you see how amazing he is. And when you get in a really tough jam, you'll hire him. But the idea was that John brought up that when you put your work online, when you do observable work, you actually knit people together in a way that earlier patterns of living did when we all lived in the village and we could go down to see the village blacksmith. We could go down to see the village dentist. We could go down to the saloon. There's the reception again. Um, 
And we would know by watching other people work what kind of a thing a blacksmith was, and maybe whether we would want to be one or not. So this was John's Exhibit A for the value and the business sustainability of a kind of open, observable work. And John isolated several factors in what he called observable work. One was narration of work. Let's cut to the chase. This is called blogging most of the time, all right? I've lived through many, many years of people saying, blogging, oh, it's a terrible word. It's a great word. It's, a, it's, it's just a fantastic word, and just take it from me, all right? Narration of work. That's the first thing John pointed out. Telling the story of what you're doing instead of simply delivering the content. You actually make it into a story. The possibility of online apprenticeship, which John has found he can do in learning to play guitar, learning how to do woodworking, learning how to mow his lawn, learning how to run. Uh, all these are possibilities. If you haven't gotten into the get ready for your knee replacement surgery genre, there's a whole raft of them up there too. Um, I wouldn't do that on a full stomach. Nevertheless, and I, I'm also a little unclear about the apprenticeship angle of that. Uh, never mind. Um, the idea of tacit knowledge, this becomes very, very important. Many students report that they learn the most from their teacher's digressions. Maybe that's wishful thinking on my part. But there is a way in which when you're telling the thing in a way that's a narrative, in a way that invites participation, sometimes these little things that you don't even know that you know and other people don't know will simply slip out. The things that we don't necessarily think to present, but in the moment it comes out in ways that communicate valuable knowledge that would otherwise be silent. John also talks about screencasting to document our work in the virtual world. How many of you have done a screencast at some point? Good. You should all learn to do that. In fact, the iPhone and the Android platforms have it built in. It was one of the first things I noticed when I got my iPhone that you could take a picture of what was on the screen. Right? How many of you have taken a picture of something that's on the screen to share with somebody else? All right. Five years ago, probably two people would have done that at most in this room. But there's huge value in this because when you go into the virtual world, you're going someplace and you want to take pictures of where you've been so you can share that with other people. Uh, shout out at this point to Jerry Slazak. Where are you, Jerry? Jerry turned me on to the John Udell screencast on heavy metal umlaut bands, which started the whole John Udell thing for me. How many of you have seen John Udell's heavy metal umlaut band screencast? All right. You've got some fun in store for you tonight. <laughs> Bring the whole family around. Most of it's suitable for workplace. The part where it's vandalized on the Wikipedia page and it's not suitable for workplace, John gets by that so professionally that it's suitable for workplace. Okay. And then a video to document our work in the physical world. I'd say this is probably not lecture capture, Exactly, although it could be, depending on the lecture. But it is an opportunity to make a movie of what we're doing in the real world so that can be shared as well. Those are the things outlined in a blog post called Mind, Hands, and Heart. John Leak on Internet Video for Sharing Knowledge About Historic Home Preservation. Don't try to write that URL down. Just Google Udell Mind, Hands, Heart. Now, that's observable work. Thank you very much. Now for disruption. Does anyone in here have serious doubts that we are living in a time of massive disruption? I'm curious, really, it's a real question. All right, then I will be able to go a little faster and not have to make that part of the case. We will simply take it on faith that we are living in a massively disruptive time. You may remember that the disruptor was the bad weapon in the Star Trek universe. The phaser was a good clean stun or you just got vaporized. It was, it was over with very, very quickly. However, the Romulans initially, the Klingons later got them, uh, had these instruments called disruptors, which were outlawed by whatever Geneva conventions hold true in the Star Trek universe, um, which the Romulans disobey because somebody has to. And so the disruptor would, allow, would just make you writhe in pain as you were being torn to bits. So if you're not 
feeling a little writhy? If there's no pain in your experience of the modern telecommunications global light speed revolution, then um, probably you're not paying close attention. So let's look at this again. Let's recap, shall we? Observable work in a time of disruption. Oh, as we writhe together. Narration of work. Tell the story of your writhing. Online apprenticeship. I will take on any writhing apprentice who wants to be um, privy to that experience. Tacit knowledge. What, how are you suffering? Inside, right? Screencasting to document our work in the virtual world. No lack of examples of disruption there. No lack of examples about how our work in the real world is being disrupted. And unfortunately, this is where the talk takes a somber turn. I've turned but a challenge for the EdTech tribe. EdTech, I will define loosely to include anyone who is working in the field of digital expression or thinking about the field of digital expression. Uh, there are such people. You probably are one or know one or, or you're sitting next to one. And in this world, the most massive disruption of all comes here. Oh, please, not another neoliberal techno-utopia. <laughs> Can you believe that home builder, John Leake? Really? John. Somebody's doing something nefarious in that observable work, don't you think? I mean, really. Let's, let's, let's just go back here a minute, all right? I mean, look at that. You can see that's a techno-utopia. You can see that's a neoliberal. Late-stage capitalist? White male hegemonist. Anti-tree. Boy, a tough crowd. Y'all just going to buy this? Come on now. Right, so here's the deal. There is a way in which, as I think about the state of educational technology, what we're doing in higher ed, I get worried. Will the academy eat itself yet again? Not because it won't adopt MOOCs, maybe it will. Not because it won't adopt the internet, maybe it will. Not because it won't get connected, maybe it will. Maybe we always bring the snake into the garden with us. And I worry about that. Here's a blog post by a friend and colleague, Alex Reed. He blogs at Digital Digs. And this was a particular post he wrote called Ramsey, Lou, Cultural Critique, and DH. How many of you know what DH is? All right, see? What's the matter with the rest of you? You must not be faculty. <laughs> you don't know the state of the conversation. You're probably complicit. <laughs> Are you the man? All right, somebody shout it out. What's DH? See, right? Good. Say it with me. Digital humanities. See, they even, uh, what's wrong with you all? You're not supposed to, you don't repeat after me, please. All right, so you go to this particular post, and this is a guy who runs the writing instruction program at SUNY Buffalo. And uh, very theoretically sophisticated, highly refined in only the way PhDs can be. Thank you very much. And he's writing this post about the limits of what he calls cultural critique. That is the thing that says, oh no, another techno-utopian, post-liberal, late-stage capitalist, white male hegemonist, tree hater, woodworker. And in this post, and I will read these slides to you, and you will like it. The one nice thing about cultural critique is that you can always count on it to make the same argument. I think it's safe to say that Ramsey and Lou have more generosity toward critique than I do. Ramsey writes, writing a book of contra-cultural studies seems to me to be the wrong direction entirely. I would like to make positive statements about what we're doing, about why it's different, and about the ethical problems it raises. The insights of cultural criticism are not so easily dismissed. That's the sound of the academy munching on itself. You hear that? That's okay. That's okay. I'm saying that sincerely. You'll see why that's important in a moment. Uh, Alex goes on, I understand Ramsey's position, especially from within the DH world. How many of you live within the DH world? You don't have PhDs. All right, that's all right. Where speaking against cultural studies is likely to result in a lot of vitriol being sent 
in one's direction. Actually, it's all too easy to critique critique because everything is always already subject to critique and critique is interminable. Cultural critique is its own disciplinary hegemony reproducing itself. It's the thought police of the humanities, posing as skepticism, but assailing its detractors as automatically being willing, or perhaps even worse, unwitting service of hegemony. Now, stay with me for a moment. But I agree with Ramsey that it's not worth doing that, but maybe for different reasons. For me, critiquing critique just feeds back into the same machine. The point is to move on from critique and do something different, which is what Alex tried to do in this blog post, carrying the entire heavy weight of the academy as it eats itself and grows fat on its own corpus. This is what it seems to me in the dead of night would be the nightmare scenario. And this picks up on something I heard Audrey say. What are we doing that actually communicates the value of what we're doing to an outside world that actually thinks that Alice Munro may have deserved a Nobel Prize or that you can actually say one piece of writing might be more influential than another or in which the conversation about the enormous opportunities that we have at this moment in history turns into something that's not just inquiring into other people's hidden motives. Now, brief digression. I have encountered hidden motives in my life. Sometimes I have hidden my own. I am not naive about that. However, when Alex says critiquing critique just feeds back into the same machine, or as one of my colleagues likes to say, it just feeds the beast, the question is, what do you do then? How do you actually do something different? How can we move ahead in this world of possibility, keeping our wits about us, but not simply destroying our chances to do something new, something that is not academic or an exercise? Well, as soon as Alex wrote this blog post, there were comments. The first one was, I think it would improve your reasoning to read earlier critiques of technology, such as that at length. Yes. And Alex, trying hard to do what he says we should do in the midst of a snark coming his way, says, second paragraph, in the 20 years since I first stepped into grad school, I've encountered plenty of verbal vitriol. The suggestion that something would improve your reasoning is a fairly light ad hominem jab. In grad school, the Red Theory Collective, as they called themselves, would attack anyone who did not share their convictions with the certainty that no other position was morally or intellectually acceptable. Having an interest in Deleuze meant being ludic. Now, probably half the house now is so, right? You'd want to be ludic, right? It means playful, right? But no, inside the academy, we will eat ourselves. We will throw away this opportunity because otherwise, how could we say we deserve to get out of grad school? Being a rhetorician, oh sorry, having a, an interest in Deleuze meant being ludic, which was apparently a code word for being a reprobate. Being a rhetorician who studies technology in departments that were predominantly about literary study has often meant being perceived as the devil incarnate. And that takes all kinds of forms from personal attacks to strategic bureaucratic moves. I've constructed a career around being a necessary evil. I wish I had written that sentence. And I may yet, because I do have permission to remix and reuse it. <laughs> and then my favorite part, but we've all been through these things, right? Hell, one of my colleagues called another one a lunatic on the department on the email list this morning, and it's not even 8 a.m. yet. Anybody in the department here? <laughs> the one thing we all should know is that theory and a thorough humanities education does not produce people who are more civil or ethical. Sometimes I fear that nothing will improve our reasoning, to use your phrase. Now I urge you, just after the heavy metal umlaut band excursion that you'll take, to find this particular post. Just Google Alex Reed Cultural Critique. It'll be right there. Because later in the comment stream, they actually have a conversation. Alex calls Michael out. Michael responds. After about three or four turns, they establish common ground. Common ground not because one person's read something, the other person hasn't, and can be beaten up thereby, not because one person is 
an hegemonist or the devil incarnate or a post-liberal, late-stage capitalist techno-utopian, but because, well, Michael had been up late. So he's raising small children. He was a little frayed. Alex had been working through stuff he's been trying to get over since graduate school 20 years before. That's what it does to you. And he was a little frayed. And both of them started trying to walk the walk of being civil and ethical and to do what Wikipedia advises, which is not to be a snark. The Urban Dictionary says it's a combination of snide and remark nor to exhibit verbal ingenuousness, which is not even really a word, but I won't be snarky about that, because I admire the coinage. That is brief, subtle, yet quite stabbing. Snark is often marked by deep creativity and use of psychological attack, as only PhDs can muster. It employs cold-bloodedness and is best served unprovoked. <laughs> Snark can contain hidden complementary meaning under a mean face, but it hurts more than it strengthens. And you, the thing I really love about the Urban Dictionary is that you can always buy snark mugs and shirts, so they've got a business plan. <laughs> Tagged as Frank Black, Narc, Narc, Black, Verbal Combat, Chicanery, Bombastic, Lay, Waste, to Buy, Sugar, Booger in, 19, in uh, 2007. Not that. Michael and Alex tried to do this. Finally, they tried to assume good faith. This is difficult. It's difficult to assume good faith when you know that Google has caved to the NSA. It's difficult to assume good faith when Sebastian Thrun starts tossing around this crap about 10 universities left standing. It's hard to assume good faith even when you walk up to Daphne Kohler and say, I didn't like your TED talk. I didn't think you were telling the truth. I don't believe a word you're saying. And yet, if we don't, there will be trouble. There is trouble. But here's Wikipedia. Remember Wikipedia? Ten years ago, nobody cared. About eight or seven years after that, it was the devil incarnate. Now everyone uses it. I even hear people enjoy it. Um, <laughs> and there are guidelines. Assume good faith. Conflict of interest. Don't bite the newbies. Clearly, they've never been to graduate school. Don't disrupt Wikipedia to make a point. Etiquette. Gaming the system. User pages. These are parts of Wikipedia that many people don't know about, but I urge you to take a look at their behavioral guidelines. I am not asserting that Wikipedia is perfect. I am asserting that it's miraculous, and they've worked hard amidst all of these years and all of these possibilities of useless disruption to keep something alive in which we could assume good faith and do what we do when we assume good faith, which is build together. Assuming good faith is a fundamental principle on Wikipedia. It's the assumption that editors, edits, and comments are made in good faith. Most people try to help the project, not hurt it. Just for projects, start putting in higher ed. If this were untrue, a project like higher ed would be doomed from the beginning. Well, it depends on the day. This guideline does not require that editors continue to assume good faith in the presence of obvious evidence to the contrary. Assuming good faith does not prohibit discussion and criticism. Rather, editors should not attribute the actions being criticized to malice unless there is specific evidence of malice. That's hard, and it will always be a judgment call. And yet, without it, no Wikipedia. Without it, maybe no higher ed or civilization. So there's the snark. You may seek it with thimbles and seek it with care. You may hunt it with forks and hope. You may threaten its life with a railway share. You may charm it with smiles and soap. That's exactly the method the bellman bold in a hasty parenthesis cried. That's exactly the way I've always been told that the capture of snarks should be tried. So as you head to the reception, Break out your forks. Break out your hope. If you have smiles and soap, use them too. Think about the fawns and the fact that he jumped the shark. And while you think about that, think about whether or not you have a chance, like me, because this came to me as I thought about a moment when I had been snarky. And let's see if we can jump the snark instead. Because in the end, what we in this tribe need to do, need to have, need to show, 
in an age of disruption is just where John Udell started all of this. Mind, hands, heart, omit any one of those at your peril. Thank you. Mm. You'd be foolish to have questions. <laughs> <laughs> but I would be happy to entertain any of them. Raise your hand, we'll come to you. Don't be shy, don't be shy. <laughs> oh no. Just kidding. We would never no, do that. We're not. We would never do that. No. He's kidding, I'm not. Okay, well, I will be around, and you know where to find me. All right? I'll be with the wine. Thank you, Gardner. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Gardner.